God like you. Lord, there is none like you. Come on. Lord, there is none. Yes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Listen, listen, listen. There's something that's attacking you. Something that has been bothering you and chasing you and like a hook in your side. You try to move forward, but there's this thing. There's only one thing that can cut that hook. It's praise. So as you glorify his name, that hook is coming out of you. Because the hook of Satan, listen to this, the hook of Satan cannot stand the praise of man. Ah. Lord, there is none yeah, like you. Lord, there is none. It's coming out. It's coming out. Lord, there is none like you. You are the King of Kings. Lord, there is none like you. Lord, there is none like you. Lord, there is none like you. You are the
Church, one more time, just give him a hand clap of praise in this place. Hand clap of praise, a shout of praise. When praises go up, come on, help me say it again. When praises go up, oh, uh, uh, I just, I'm blessed on one side of me, this other side. I just needed a bit. When praises go up. Woo! Hallelujah. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. You may take your seat. You may take your seat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, straight into the word. Straight into the word. Straight into the word. Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. We're going to be reading verse 5 to 9. That's it. 5 to 9. Five to nine, that's it. Numbers 21, Numbers 21. You see what's nice is that we actually are continuing the last part of what we could not do last week. I'm going to get out of the way of this little device because it's getting my nerves. I'm walking around like this here everywhere trying to, to get it from my phone. To yeah, and every time I try it when I'm in this building, it don't work. I'm not sure why. Now, don't get spiritual on me now. I think it's just because there's no reception in this place. <laughs> so it works well at home. Are you blessed to be in the house of God today? Yeah. I just want to say this. You make this the house of God. Yeah. Oh, somebody's not feeling good about themselves. Somebody's not feeling worthy about themselves. Let me just tell you, I don't care what somebody said to you yesterday. The day before, they can tell you you're good for nothing, you're loser, you go to church for nothing, you're useless, you. Listen, 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 listen to me. The oil just washes all that away because it's you that makes church what it is. It's you that makes church what it is. You bring the glory of God when you enter this place. You know when you leave this place here what it is? It's just a building. It's just a building. I can tell you now, you can come in here and think you're going to receive a blessing all on your own when nobody's here, and you can try. Let me tell you, God will show up because you're here. Even if you're here alone, God's not showing up because you came to this building. He's showing up. Listen, listen, man. Listen, church. He's showing up because his glory goes where you go. He says, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Yes, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus says that I will not dwell in buildings made by man, but I will dwell in man himself. You are the temple of the Lord. I don't care what somebody may have told you, or even when you looked in the mirror, what you could have said to yourself or about yourself, or something from the past is still hooked on you. I'm telling you right now, you are, you are a child of God. And where you go, the glory of God goes. Take that to the bank. Somebody say amen. amen. Yes, 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 amen. Numbers 21. Numbers 21. We are continuing. And what's nice about this, oh, I'm so, so happy about this. What's nice about this is that we are, we, the No Foreign Gods series, can we, I'm going to take that word series out. It's the No Foreign Gods way forward. That's what it is, because we're going to find this in every different series or every different word. We are going to find a little bit of the snow foreign gods. Every time it's like you're cleaning your house and you found these hojos. You're cleaning your house. How? I didn't open this straw. Oh, there you are. So you're not going to say to the cockroaches, oh, sorry, man, I was only cleaning this side. We finished with, that, with, with fumigating now, so you can remain till the next fumigation. No, you're going to make sure that every time you see one of those cockroaches in your house now, Oh, you don't have cockroaches in your house. I believe you. You can call blood, sweat, and tears. That's Reggie blood. And he'll come and he will fumigate. And I mean, I only use him because he's good. But sometimes, you know, when you look again and you go into one drawer that you haven't been in, before, you know, in a long time, and you open, you say, well, how the heck did you survive this one? You know, and you'll find a, new, a few chokos here and there. So 
We always bring cleaning and no foreign gods is the way forward. It is every time and, and I believe that the Holy Spirit will make us so sensitive to any time there's a foreign god. Every time there's a foreign god, it's just going to say, yes, another. Every time we open a drawer and, it, and we see it trying to duck between the dishing up spoons and, and no, no, we're going to say, you're coming out of here, there's another foreign god. So we're gonna, we're gonna, you're going to hear it so continuously, but listen, don't let that be the focus. Don't let that be the focus because that's just a cleanup operation that I believe God is doing. For those that don't know, I'm going to tell you straight up that do you know that <laughs> the, today, in today's time, Where's numbers now? Hi, boy. How can numbers? Oh, it's there. Numbers 21. Do you know that in today's time, it is so sad that we have become information. We, I said we, me too. We have become information searchers, but not from our own sources anymore, but from man. What's happening is that our ears are hunting information and no longer our eyes and our brains. What do I mean by that? Thank you for asking. I mean that you will, you, you, it's easier if Siri tells you where to go. It's easier if, if one of these devices tell you what it's about. If you want to just look up a word, you just need to say, what does this word mean in Hebrew? And it'll give you, but any, oh, thank you. And you don't even understand the three different relative words that go with that because you're not reading about it. You're actually hearing about it. So our information went from hunting, reading, seek, and you shall find, to hear, and you shall know. And that's the age of modern technology today, is that it's making us, making us more lazy and more lazy and more lazy. I said us, once again. But the danger in the information is that if you do not have the understanding, you can misuse the information. Or you can trust somebody else that trusted somebody else, that trusted somebody else. And I'll say it again, that trusted somebody else. I'm going back decades and generations on what they said and not what you witness for yourself. And as a result, church takes on such a distorted view, such an overcolored view. Church takes on like my hash browns, too much spices, and it's supposed to have been just four things, but it's got chilies and curry powder, and yes, that's an over fried sometimes, and whatever. It is. Church takes on all these extra things. But I thank God that is left with us a recipe, one that I can just say this much. I can, I can try and deceive you how much and say, just go and look. Nikita, just look in your, look, let me tell you, you don't even need to open your Bible. Just listen to what I'm saying. This is what John 3, 16 says. No, you can actually say, uh -uh, that, that's not what it says because I can go into the word of God myself. And I can have a look and I can read for myself. And God has given me the spirit of understanding by way of Holy Spirit for me to interpret those basic scriptures. And in doing so, and as we exercise the muscle of seek and find, know and understand, we move away from this generation that is only out to hunt for information heard, to seeking information for understanding. You, you must know it's so important. It's, let me give you an example. If somebody comes to somebody else, let's not use your, because your government start questioning your husbands. Let's just use uh, lady A. Lady A hears from Lady C that her husband was in the club last night. It, it is up to that lady to go. Or your husband was with uh, Mrs., Mrs. Jones somewhere. Now what would you think of this Lady A? If she just went straight up to her husband, poof, bah, 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 and then spoke afterwards. Or not even speak. And walk away and say, I heard. And maybe Lady C didn't even know who your husband is. She was talking about your husband's brother. Now, because you didn't get the information yourself and have some understanding that there's a possibility that what Lady C said to Lady A could be misunderstood. Yes, it was a Jackson or whoever inside that place, but it was not Mr. Jackson 1, it was Mr. Jackson 2. And so it's so important, if you can follow with me through, it's so important that you, you must not just take people at their word. Because let me tell you something, the smoothest of sounds does not carry the glory of God. 
I don't care whose mouth it can come from. Verify it according to the word of God. Don't fight subjectively over something that you didn't search objectively. I'll explain that. To fight subjectively is to deny something on the basis of tradition and not object on the basis of what you researched. Subjective fights are fights you shouldn't get into. The minute a person tells you, well, I'm telling you this is the way we did it for so many years, it's simple. You just need to say, show it to me in the Bible. And they say, listen, you can't be, be always pointing to the Bible. Do you know so-and-so? Do you know so-and-so from 1960 this, from 1950 that? Do you know this one? Do you know that one? The minute they do that, they are subjective and they have no basis for their argument. Walk away. Because God, in all his infinite wisdom, put everything you need in his word. Somebody say amen. Amen, amen, amen. Let's deal with some foreign gods now. You know, we can be focusing on foreign gods in the church, in the church practices, in the church culture. And I just want to say this, that don't f for one moment think that that's the only place where foreign gods actually uh, like to infiltrate. Because there are so many different type of foreign gods. So as we go through different messages, you're going to see some. Let's open a different drawer today. We're going to open a drawer of our minds and our hearts. I want you to read Numbers 21, verse 5. Can you read that together with me from, the, from what's on the screen, please? Numbers 21, verse 5. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our souls loads with worthless bread. So the Lord, verse 6, so the Lord so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Let's go to verse 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. Keep reading. Next verse. Yeah. Next. And they journeyed from Obot and camped at Ije Abarim in the wilderness, which is east of Moab, towards the sunrise. We're going to stop there. We're going to stop there. And I want to speak to you today from a very simple title, yet powerful title, that is, I see it on the cross. For those that saw the announcement, I see it on the cross. I see it. On the cross. What do you see on the cross? Is the question. Ah, I love the answer because that's also what I thought I see on the cross. And today, we are going to move the focus without thinking we are in, that we are actually offending Jesus. We are going to move the focus based on God's word. Based on God's word. I see it on the cross because when sin and guilt and shame becomes a foreign God, we try to live, and we find ourselves dying. Anybody knows what it's like to try and move forward, but something from the past keeps hindering you. Something from the past keeps hooking you. We try and move forward, and we find these foreign gods pulling us back. They try to impersonate who we are and clothe us with false garments of heaviness. But just a few days ago, just a few days ago, 738,760 days to be exact. That's 2,024 years ago I've done the maths. God done 
a complete transaction. Just over 700,000 days ago. Yeah, days. You see, when we bring it into days, as you say, is that calculation right? I doubted it myself. But if we've got to put it in days, put years, because it's easy for us to say just more than 2,000 years ago. Oh, shame. Somebody picked the child up. It's easy for us to say just more than 2,000 years ago, Jesus hung on the cross. And how, how distant that is. How distant that is. But when we say just over 700,000 days ago, it's, 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 it's the same because it says, a, 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 you know, a day in the Lord is like a thousand, you know, a thousand to one day. It's like saying just a few days ago, Christ completed the transaction that you don't need to carry that foreign God called guilt, that foreign God called shame, that foreign God called hurt, that foreign God called unforgiveness, that foreign God called religion, that foreign God called offense, that foreign God called sin. Because Christ hung on the cross and bled and died just a few days ago. And what was transacted on the cross had you in mind. Let's pray. Eternal and most gracious God, I thank you, Father. Father, I thank you, Almighty God, for the opportunity to share your word. Oh, God, I thank you that you be glorified and you alone. No one else be glorified. Father, in these few minutes, God, polarize and bring to light the transaction where you paid the price for us. That we may go home understanding what you have given us on the cross. We thank you that Christ hung on the cross. But Father, show us today the meaning of the cross and how it benefits us. In Jesus' precious holy name, let your word and your word alone be glorified in this place. In Jesus' precious holy name, amen. Amen, amen. amen. I see it on the cross. This is to every person, every person who knows what it's like to feel scarred. Who knows what it's like to feel like where you come from defines where you are. Knows what it's like to be looked down upon. Not only in the public circles or in the school circles, but sometimes even in the religious circles. Knows what it's like to look down upon. It almost seems like there's something that is on you that others translate and it's bringing you down. You don't walk like it's there. You don't, you don't behave like it's there. You try your best to give God praise. You try your best to go to church. You try your best to live a normal life. But it almost seems like you feel like others can see this thing that weighs down on you. And it is that that brings death where God said, I want to give you life. It is that that robs us of the true essence of living today. Anybody ever worry about tomorrow so much that you stop living today? How many of us, and I've said this before, how many of us today can reflect on what you stressed about last year that never come to pass? The thing you thought you were going to lose that you never lose. The thing you thought would happen, but God just came through on time. You see, he didn't come through when you wanted him to, but he came through on time. And sometimes his on time seems three days late. Sometimes his on time actually works in ways that you didn't expect it to. Because I know I want God to bless me through somebody that I want him to bless me through. But sometimes God can just be controversial when he humbles us. And he can bless us through a gnarring source. He can bless us through an irritating source. He can bless us through that mother-in-law that you don't like. And he will bless you through certain ways that contradict what you were expecting from God. But nevertheless, he comes through. He's a God that comes through. Sometimes things die, but he's a God that comes through. Sometimes he won't come through the way you want him to come through, but he comes through. 
We mentioned last week that there is a much bigger picture than this little dot called earth. And I know because we take a deep dive into earth and we go outside it so many times and don't do it. It's scary. Trust me, it's scary. Don't do it. And you go outside and you have a look and you just look and you can almost see the end of earth when you look at the globe. You can almost see this is where it ends. And we, we base our lives not just on what you can see on the outside that looks like a round sky. We don't base our lives only on that, but we base our lives on the system that has been bred inside of us. To such a degree that we forget that the word of God speaks more about a life eternal than life on this earth. And as a result of that, we weigh up everything about the God that we serve, everything about this spiritually. And he says, those who worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. We cannot understand the truth if we base everything around your birth date and your death date on earth. Because to accept Christ in your life is the beginning of eternal life. To accept Christ, like we said last week, is the beginning of being part of the royal family, the kingdom of God. Now, no, we have not, have not preached much about the kingdom of God. As a result, we're strangers in our own father's land. We are kings and princes walking the grounds while slaves are riding horses. That's because you are a prince and you don't know it. You are a princess and you don't know it. It's because we've taught so much about Christ's suffering. He didn't ask you to suffer with him. He said, cast it unto me. I've done the work. The transaction is complete. I've come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. But somewhere there's something that's biting you. And every time it bites you, you die. Some of us have died a thousand times. Some people went and we've been to their funerals and they've had one burial, just one burial, Charlene, one burial, but they've died a thousand times. Nobody knew that for maybe 20, 30 years prior to that, that death was inevitable because every time something happened to them, a snake came and bit them and something died in them. How many people walk around today, go to church today, glorify God today? Dress up today, have a car parked outside today, but there's half of you that is dead because you've been bitten too much in this life. God said that I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. So it is this message that brings us to a transition, a transition into the kingdom life. And when we start the kingdom life, we have to first understand the meaning of the cross. Because you cannot enter into the kingdom life if you have not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you don't understand his death, burial, and resurrection, you cannot say you've accepted Christ. You cannot have unbelief and say you've accepted Christ. You cannot be feeling guilty of something you've done 10 years ago and say you've accepted Christ. For to, for to still own something that God forgot denies the cross of its true existence. And today, we want to show you that the cross is not a Christ carrier, that the cross is a sin bin that God made just for you and for I. Ooh. I know that it's very difficult, it's very hard, because we've, 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 we've went on and we've taught so much, taught so much, about you can get it and five steps to be a more blessed life and, and three steps to receive the spirit of God and five ways to speak in tongues and how to tithe correctly or how to give correctly that God will bless you in abundance. And we're going to talk more about giving one of the Sundays because we have to teach on giving. We have to understand the, the, the relationship of giving. We're going to get there. And I'm not, I'm not phased by that. I'm not because there's word that needs to come through today. And that is to understand the cross. For without understanding the cross, you cannot call yourself a kingdom child. You can seek the powers and like, like Jesus says, you wicked generation, always seeking a sign. Why seek a sign when you can go for your assurance? The blessed assurance. Get your ID copy first. Get your citizenship first. Understand the price that God paid for you first. So when you know that you're carrying the stamp that says you're a kingdom child, let's look after, let's go get everything else. Because didn't he say, seek ye faster? Seek ye faster? And all these... 
things shall be added unto you. I know we, because we become chasers of all these things, chasers of gifts, chasers of all these things, because we have not seek the kingdom of God first. And as a result, we live a defeated life. Defeated. Because just let the money go down and you don't know how to dance in the rain. Just let some sadness hit the home and you don't know how to cling to peace. Just let death come knocking at your door and you don't understand there's one more powerful and that is eternal life. And so as a result of that, we focused on some good things, but they're not the right things first. Because you cannot focus on something without understanding who you are in the kingdom of God. Without understanding the accomplished work of the cross of Calvary. Somebody say amen. amen. The children of Israel have been walking 39 years in the desert. 39 years in the wilderness. And we said last week that they, they, in the overcoming discouragement message that they come across this place that looks. And they say, isn't that the Red Sea? And we, we dived into, those who were here last week, we dived into a beautiful message about the horizon. The horizon of the Red Sea. And we spoke about how your, 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 where, you, where you took off and where you land looks like the same place, but it's not. You are in a different location. You are one step away from the promised land. But somehow there's a drawback and it almost looks like you have been stripped away of everything else. But God is getting ready to take a census on you because you're one step away from your promised land. That's what we discussed last week. But we didn't have the time to focus on the snake bites. And today we're discussing those snake bites. So the children of Israel 39 years in the desert, and they start to murmur and complain. And they say, Moses didn't know what he's doing. And you know what? They should have just left us with a duck of this worthless bread. This bread passed its expiration date. We keep eating the same thing over and over. We are tired. God has failed us, and Moses has led us astray. And God sent fiery serpents to bite them. And the word of God, as you read, says that many of them died from the snake bites. And many of them died from those snake bites because the snake bites represented sin in their lives. God sent something to polarize and say, let me give your sins that you keep doing. Let me give your sins some form of a body so you can see it. Because some of us, sometimes we can sin so much and we can wipe our mouths because we don't even know what sin looks like. We've learned to master holiness so much and we've learned to, how to act oh, so super spiritual but we are thick with lust on the outside because you know why? We don't know what sin looks like. Some of us don't mind doing a backhand deal to get a job, a backhand deal to get business, pay bribes or whatever and come to church and glory, hallelujah because we don't know what sin looks like and God sometimes sends something in a tangible form to show you what sin looks like. Some of us can come and we can lift our hands and everything but you're eyeing another man's wife or eyeing another person's husband and you don't even understand that because you don't know what sin looks like. God help us that you don't send sin in tangible form that it may come and bite us. And so God sends a fiery serpent. He sends a fiery serpent to bite them. And then he tells Moses to do something amazing and and, and, and I've, I've always wondered about this verse. I've always wondered like, God, why is there a snake on a pole? Because you talk about Christ on the cross. What is a snake on the pole? And I thank God for this revelation because it was the same thing that was killing them. God said to Moses, make a replica and put it on a pole. Take the same sin, the same snake that keeps biting them and they die because people only die through sin. When sin entered this world, man began to die. Word of God. God says, now we've made it in tangible form and the fiery serpents are biting them and they are dying. And Moses goes and they come and they say, Moses, please, 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 pray for us, please, please. These things are biting us. We don't know what to do. And we are dying here, Moses. Please, we are sorry. I know what happened. We spoke against God and we spoke against you, Moses. Please, I'm asking you something about the Israelites that I admired is that they were not scared to say when they've done something wrong. They weren't scared because, you see, they understood the wrath of God. Some of us, 
We don't know the wrath of God and we think that we can just walk over people. We can just walk over things. We can just scandal about people. We don't understand that when something bad happens in our lives, we ask ourselves why. How much of that comes from whatever we have sown? Because Galatians 6, 7 is clear and says, whatsoever a man sows, that, and own, that only shall he reap. And may I say, that's in the New Testament. Because I know I've also got a little bottle that's got some grace liquid there. And every time I do something wrong, I just sprinkle a little bit of grace on me. And I say, well, I should be cleansed now. And the blood should have washed me clean. Because why I understand and I thank God for the power of the blood that forgives sins. But he also says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. That whatsoever things we sow, that and that only shall we reap. And so they go to Moses and they say, Moses, we were scandling about you. We're talking bad about God. We don't know how to control our mouths, Moses. We know that you've been trying your best, but just because we went through a bit of a frustration, we said some stuff about you. And we said some stuff about your God. Please pray for us, Moses. And as this conversation is happening, somebody's screaming in the background. As this conversation is happening, somebody's family is, you hear a mournful cry in the background because people are dying. Moses, please pray for us. And Moses goes to God and he says, forgive them. Now, Moses, you beautiful leader, I would think that at least somewhere in the word you give us the rights to challenge them and say, yeah, can you see? Keep talking about me. Touch not the anointed of God. I thought Moses right there, you could have at least put something for leaders because today people still scandal about leaders and we feel nothing happens to them. So Moses, you gave me no ammunition, but no, that is the work of a servant and a humble leader. You get no rights to tell people off. So you go to God and you pray for them. You don't take this pulpit and start bashing people and throwing rocks at people. That's not what this pulpit is for. The pulpit is not a person's power. It's for the glory of God, lest you be struck down. And maybe not in the physical, but struck down in your finances, struck down in your health, struck down in every area of your life, in your family, in your children, the things that your heart's desire. Sometimes it's struck down. People won't see it on the, on the outside, but you can see it and feel it on the inside. So he gives me no ammunition to say this is where Moses says we can tell you all off. No. And Moses says, the word of God says that Moses goes and he prays for them. God, they dying. Come on, Lord. These are your people. But they dying. Sin is biting them. You sent them on a mission. They will never reach their promised land or their destination according to your will if sin kills them along the way. Help them, God. And God says, take a pole and make a replica, some versions say, Make a replica, make a same fiery, make the same image of what is biting them. Put it on a pole and raise it up. That anyone who looks upon that which bites them on the pole will live. Make a replica of that thing. So anybody who looks upon that cross may see the snake that's biting them not on the ground but transacted and put on the pole and you shall live. Let's talk about Christ in relation to the sh shadow that is happening here. Christ goes to the cross and he says if I be lifted up on the hill I'll draw all men unto me. Now, Jesus walked this earth, and he grew up as a baby and as a boy, and then his mother and him lost him because he's busy there, and he's questioning with the leaders in the, in the synagogues, and, oh, he's such a cute baby, you know, and, and I know when we picture Jesus, we picture, because the Bible tells me he had hair like lamb's wool, and feet like brass, you know, like burnt brass, hair like lamb's wool, my hair's like lamb's wool. He didn't have extensions. 
Don't go crucified now, please. Not going to go there. You picture Jesus the way you want to. At the end of the day, it's all about what you know about God that matters. And Christ came to this earth and he walked this earth for about 33 odd years and he performed so many beautiful miracles and he showed so much love and compassion and he spent more time in the mountains, in the fields and in the streets than he did in the synagogues and in the temples. Christ came for those who are weak, afflicted. He came and he came and restored life and hope and he came and reconnect the entire Israel together. There was division among God's people and Christ came to try and bring about unity among God's people. And he came on a mission and during the course of those years in ministry, it was so nice to hear as he entered the Jordan and, and the dove came and settled upon him and the windows of heaven opened and it was heard by many when it said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. It was so good because that was like a beginning of Christ's ministry and everybody starts following him. Did you hear? Did you witness the dove at the Jordan? I was there. I got the receipts for it. I got the proof. I've been there with Christ for a long time. And so they followed him and he went to the boat and met the sons of Zebedee and said, follow me. And they didn't even argue with Christ and they began to follow him. And Christ went to the mountains and the hills and he reached a stage where his ministry was nothing but healing, 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 healing and deliverance, healing and deliverance, healing and deliverance and setting people free, opening of the blind eyes and raising of the dead, making the lame to walk, causing unbelievers to believe. Christ was just in the thick of things and everybody was following that to the stage when he got to Zacchaeus' town. He had no place to walk. The city shut down as if it was the EFF, the MK, and the ANC, and the TA, all having a rally all at the same time. Those crowds could not compare to when Christ just entered a town. Things had to stand still. Markets had to close because Jesus is on the scene, and everybody knows wherever Jesus is, there's real life, real truth, and real miracles. Somebody say amen. And he goes from town to town, and even when he was on his way to Bethany, he passes a funeral procession of a lady who only had but one son. Only had one son. And we don't talk much about this miracle, because there's not much content to preach on it. But we're going to get there one day, because I love the miracles that Christ performed as he walked on this earth. We're going to get there, because he touches the coffin of this only lady, this lady that only had one son. And he touches the coffin. And the same man that was going to his funeral, he, to, to his burial, had got up from uh, the, uh, the casket and went back home with his mother. They ate the food, the funeral food. The whole thing was canceled and he went home. I love that about Christ. Christ is always there doing this with nature, turning nature on its back, showing nature that even you, you bow down to me, showing death that even you, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whatever I say goes, I love this about Christ. And so Christ was hailed. Christ was revered. Christ was called rabbi and teacher and messiah. Christ was called God and Christ was called the lamb of God. And Christ, Christ walked this earth and everybody had a glorious name for him. Everyone was his friend and everybody looked up to him and things were good until, until it came close to going to the pole, the cross. He's still Jesus. And they arrest him that night in the Garden of Gethsemane when he is praying. And he says to his disciples, stop sleeping, come and pray. Stop sleeping, come and pray. And he says, Lord, take this cup from me. Take this cup. And nevertheless, not your will, but my will be done. Because what Christ saw there, he saw, he saw the transaction in motion. I know a lot of us think that it was the pain that Christ was, it was worried about. And the anguish and the bleeding and the dying. He wasn't worried about that. He was worried about one thing that came face to face with him in the flesh in Gethsemane, and that is your sin and my sin on him. He who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians, became sin for our sake. And I know we think that it's all about, but Christ, it's all about holiness. He who knew no sin, to not know sin. Some of you, if I just take you right outside of 
who you are right now when I say, listen, I know you're saved and you're glorified and all that, and you know you got Christ stamp all over you and a Jesus tattoo on your neck and all that, but I just need you to come with me into a red light district just tonight just to go and, just to go and minister. Ooh. Wait now. Who old's going to be there? No, just you. But you need to go in undercover. You need to dress like them. Oh, the Lord rebuke you. You got to understand that this was a complete identity shift for Christ to become the sin bin, the container of all man's sins. For him to say, take this cup from me, because that cup was dreaded sin. That cup was dark evil. That cup was everything you've ever done both in public and in secret. That cup in the graveyard, everyone that, that is there is, is, is filled with silent prayers at night that only Christ knows and we know. Those silent confession prayers, those disgusting prayers, that cup was filled with all of those sins. And Christ gets ready for the cross and they call out and they say, who would you, and he goes, he goes to jail. And in prison, among others, there's two thieves and a politician, a rebel. And when it's time for the people to choose, they say, no, no, no. no uh, we choose Barabbas, the rebel. Let him lose. Crucify him. But the two thieves, one had enough sense to know that, and I, I would just go on a limb and say, he comes from a good home. He, he, he sets out on a bad path in his life, but he comes from a good home. He knew right from wrong, not like the other thief. Because the other thief says, if you're the Christ, why don't you save yourself and save us? Huh? And the other one says, no, 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 don't say that, don't say that. You see, this man is innocent. He don't deserve this, but you see us. You see us. He knew right from wrong. Grow your child up in a way he should grow. When he's old, he will not depart from it. The knowledge stays there. Even when they do wrong, the knowledge stays there. The wisdom that you put in stays there. No matter where they are, people might look at them like rubbishes, but they are loaded with wisdom. There's a light glowing inside of them that will come out one day, even on the cross, even on the 11th hour, it will come out. Somebody say amen. You're not there on the 11th hour when somebody dies and you say, oh, shame. They died a drug addict. They died in sin. They died like this. You're not there on the 11th hour when they're sitting all alone, shivering and shaking, and their heart's about to stop, and the compassionate angel is on the side of them receiving the thief's prayer between them and God. Shut up if you have any opinions because you are not there in the silent prayers between them and God. Because God can forgive on the 11th hour, God can forgive. God can be merciful to those who we won't even show mercy to. Oh, you don't know the love of God. I'm going to ask you again, what is it that we see on the cross? For on the cross, by the sixth hour, the thieves start having an argument and Christ hangs in the middle. He's been stripped, he's been whipped, he's been shamed, he's been put thorns on his head that pierce through his skull. He's got blood running down through his eyes. His face is disfigured, but not a bone in his body is broken. His back is open where his lungs can be seen as he tries to gasp for air because the cross is a way of, of, of restricting your breathing and he's trying to push up with his back of the heel. That's why Genesis says that you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head because why? in order to breathe on the cross, you've got to push up with your heel and your heel starts to bruise against the pole to get some air. <gasps> but Christ hung on because the word of God says that he gave up the spirit. They tried to give him sour wine at first. Sour wine the Romans used to try and take the pain away from those who are being crucified. The first time they tried to give him sour wine, he refused it, he tasted it, and he spat it out because he's not scared of pain. It was on the second time, just as the transaction was complete, that he said, I thirst. And they, 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 they dipped a sponge or a hyssop branch and gave it to him and he took a sip and said, it is finished. 
The words it is finished means the transaction is complete, my beloved. Because from the ninth hour, darkness filled the earth. And when darkness filled the earth, this was after his final ministry. His final ministry and final forgiveness. To the ones who crucified him, the ones who betrayed him, and the thief hanging on the cross. Leave that picture there, please. The one hanging on the cross was his final, final, as we call, altar call. And he said to him, I tell you this day, you'll be with me in paradise. I thirst. It is finished. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. The transaction of all man's sins. If I'm going to be the lamb, and they don't need to kill lambs anymore, and they don't need to have a fire burning outside of dialogue anymore, and they don't need to be killing lambs for every time somebody sins, and then I must be wearing the ephod, and I must be going into the most holy place and making atonement for people every year. If it's going to be a once-off, I'll hang on a little longer. Because I'm not leaving this painful body until the transaction is complete. Where's all the people that go to dialogue's pain? Where's all their shame? Where's all their hurt? Where's all their sin? Bring it on. Let the transaction complete. Because I'm going to hold on on the cross until I've taken all their shame, all their pain, all their unforgiveness, all their hurt, all their betrayal. Where's all the sins of Africa? Where's all the sins of Asia? Until the entire world's sins are transacted to this body. Until Jesus is no longer hanging on the body. But only sin can be seen. To a degree that the Father turns. And he says, God, why have you forsaken me? Because the Father cannot behold evil. The Christ you say you see on the cross is because you still hold on to your sin on earth. You need to see your sin on the cross on Christ. You need to see the snake that's biting you on the pole. The thing that was killing the Israelites that bit them. God said, see it on the pole. And I'm going to ask you today, what it is? I've got mine. And I know you've got yours. What is it that bites you every day? Silent bites. Not every bite is in the open. Some are internal bites, unforgiveness, don't want to let go. Throw it to the cross. There's space for your sins. It is a sin to hold unforgiveness. Ah, you die holding on to it, it's a lost eternity. The word of God came today to say, throw it on the cross. I see hate. I see porn, I see hypocrisy, I see vulgarity, I see abortions, I see reverence to God, I see religion, I see greed, ad adultery, envy, I see addictions, I see moralism, lying, racism, divorce, apathy, murder. God says that thing that's trying to bite you and say, you're not a real Christian because you've been divorced. Throw it on the cross. Because the cross has been load tested to carry your sins. Stop helping Christ. He said, throw it here. Yeah. He says, there's space, put it here. Yeah. There's space for Africa, put it right here. Yeah. It's been load tested. And the body that hung there has been resurrected. And it died with everybody's sins. Yours. And mine, the ones we say amen to, and the ones we say ouch to. He died for everybody's sins. Even as you're looking to somebody else to say, ha, I hope this person's listening. No, you got some throwing to do yourself. Yeah. Coming to a close. We're coming to a close. And I'm going to ask you again, what is it that you see on the cross? What is it that you see on the cross? John 19, verse 30 says, So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, and he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. 
2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For he made him, he made him, God made him, the Father made the Son. For he made him who knew no sin. Knew no sin. To be holy. Oh, we're so scared of this. May that foreign God strip off you. This is the word of God. You don't understand the power of the cross. You don't understand the love of the cross. You don't understand that what transformed on the cross was holy to sinful. For he who knew, knew no sin to be a sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He took it all. Those people that are trying to look down on you, they're digging in a sin pin and they are scattering your past. They are scattering your weaknesses to the Christians. They're going to the cross and saying she thinks she's all that in church and he thinks he's all that in church. They don't realize how demonic this is. And they're taking what you threw on the sin bin, the one that was contained on the cross, that Christ said, cast everything unto me. He said, bring it all. He said he's dying for the sin. I didn't say, don't fight with me. But what we do, we take from what we threw on the cross and we scatter it on social media and we scatter it among the churches and we scatter it among the people that are leaving the church and we about everybody and you don't realize you become a trash hunter because you take what you threw on the cross and they go and scatter it out there there's only one place they could have got it from and it is from the cross that is why when people try and come up at you and they say I heard that he said this I heard that she said this you must say where did they get that from the last I remember I put it on the cross who gave them access to take what I threw to the cross to spread on social media. So is it true or not true? I don't need to answer that. I threw it to the cross. Every sin of mine hung on the one who bled and died for me. We don't. We don't. Shame from something that broke. I want to end with that. Because it's not only the sins that we commit that hurts us. It's even the things we didn't do that we become a victim of circumstance. It's shame. It's hurt. It's blame. We live a life secondary to that life God said we must live because there's still a snake of shame biting us. You caused that marriage to break. You were the one. Yes, the other one done wrong, but you made the decision to end it. You see, it comes and it and bites you. It's through you we don't have a home anymore. It's through you. It's through you. It's through you. Everything has happened through you. And God is saying, put it on the cross. Put it on the cross. You broke our home up. You're the one that caused this to daddy. You're the one because if it hadn't been for you, I'm sure daddy wouldn't have left. I'm sure daddy would have still been around. Put it on the cross because a snake was biting. And I want to tell you something about snakes. God did not let the snake stop biting him. He just brought something that can stop killing them. You can't stop some snakes from biting you in public some snakes from biting you in family some snakes from biting you and talking bad about you the cross was meant to stop it was a spiritual vac vaccination that was meant to stop the death from that bite so some people will still talk about you they'll still lie about you they'll still blame you they'll still look at you and see your past so the snake sometimes still tries to bite. But like Paul, after he was shipwrecked, a viper came. But what the, that viper didn't know is that the blood of Jesus flowed through Paul's veins. And it bit Paul, but it fell into the fire. Every bite, every bite has been cast into the fire, into the flames of hell. Because it hung with Christ 
on the cross. I want to ask you for the very last time before we stand, what is it that you see on the cross? Because I want you as we stand to see the sin. Christ is not intimidated. Oh, that's, oh, so we must see Jesus? No. No. Because the transaction took place and for three hours it was dark as he vacuumed up the world's sins into his holy body. He who knew no sin became sin. He became sin. He became sin for me. He became sin. That I don't need to die from these snake bites anymore. He became sin for me. That I may live. Let's stand please church. Glory to you, God. Glory, 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 glory. So when we go to funerals and we sing, I'll cherish the old rugged cross. And we go to funerals and we sing songs about the cross. And we even in church, in worship, when we sing, worthy is your name, you must understand that you see your sin on that cross. Because if you only see a pure Jesus, you have taken the sin that he said he'll carry with him on the cross because the cross the way to die on the cross was a curse cursed it is he who hung on the cross and he said I'll do it I'll so that you can live so that you can live so that you can live I'll take it I'll take it so every time you hear somebody talking about somebody just know that there were bin snatchers they went looking for someone's sins that somebody else threw to the cross. Stop thinking you know everybody's future and present. You don't. Somebody watching and listening to this message right now, stop it. Stop taking from the cross what people cause to the cross. Something still try and bite me every day, but every time it bites me, I look to the cross and I see it there. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, God. Thank you, Father, for bringing us closer to the cross, for, bring, for settling us on Calvary, for giving us the deep dive into understanding the power of the cross in our lives. Thank you, Almighty God, for the opportunity of seeing our sins on the cross. Right now, Every person who has received this word sees their sin on the cross, knowing that the transaction is being complete in full. No sin too heavy for the cross, be it murder, be it whatever. No sin is too heavy because the sin, has, this cross has been weight tested, load tested, and the Son of God resurrected. I thank you, God, for making space on the cross for us. That when we sing those songs, there is room at the cross. We understand that it is, a, it is a burial, it is a place where we cast our sins to. The things that bite us every day, may we see it on the cross that we may live. Let this word settle in your people this day, God, that we may live as Christ said, we must live more abundantly. I thank you, Father, for the understanding of the cross this day. In Jesus' precious holy name. And everybody said, can we give God praise for his word? If you have brought something to give into the house of God today, the word of God says, share all good things with the one who teaches you. I'm not asking for sins, but I just want to tell you this much. We all go through problems. Let me tell you one thing. When you've got a giving heart, I'm telling you right now, this is not no Hollywood casino trope. God protects those who have giving hearts. I've seen it in my own. I can't talk about anything else but my own heart, my own life that God gave me. I was once a selfish person and God showed me. 
I once just took care of myself and my family and that's it. But God took me through a process of change. I thank God that He can turn hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. Surrender your heart today to God because this assembly teaches, teaches the unadulterated Word of God, uncompromised Word of God. We give out heartfelt, true worship. Everybody in here may be broken, but we lean on the God that we trust. And this is a good place to give. This is a very good place to give. So I pray that God will give you a heart because, for example, the rent in this place, I can tell you now, is 20,000 rand a month. Now, if you look at how many of us in this place, God makes a way every month. But you know, for the ones that do give into it, I've seen the protection. I've seen guns at their heads and I've seen that no weapon fashioned and formed against him prosper. And I've seen those that don't give continuously be on the hustle. And so I'm saying, let us walk away from that and let us stop saying we, we don't have enough to give. We're here to receive. No, the devil is a liar. Take that thought and hang it on the cross. You are a prince and a princess of God. You'll go through hard times and you'll go through dips and the church will be there for you based on affordability. But let me tell you something. Every time an angel of the Lord came and visited from Abraham's days, when they realized the angel of the Lord was there, they said, don't go until we prepare something for you. Now the angels could have said, hey, we're angels, we're from the heavenly beings. We don't need bunny chows and mutton curry. So I don't know, you can take that back. You know, we're spiritual beings. No, the angels didn't say that. When Mr. When Mr. and Mrs. Manoa for Samson, and they said, hey, this is what we're going to do, even for Gideon, when they said, mighty man of Allah, and he says, hey, I've seen the Lord face to face, I'm going to die. He says, no, don't worry, you're not going to die. Okay, don't go. Let me prepare something for you. And the angel of the Lord said, prepare it. And when they finished prepared that which was tangible, the angel pointed down at the sacrifice, burnt it, and it went up as a sweet-smelling savor to God. God don't need fat. God don't need meat. He's a spiritual, infinite being. But giving is of strong relations to worship and appreciation to God. To God. I've seen it in my own life. We went from absolutely zero, where the church helped us with 200 rand for lunch. I'm telling you, Pastor Marlon came after service. It was like this, this many of us. And the offering was like just that many or less. And he came and he put 200 rand in my hand after service. And it killed whatever pride was in me. But God showed me through somebody else that said, because you've given up this to start the work of God, you don't know what's coming your way. You see, you'll, don't, you'll see what you'll see, but you don't know where I come from. I was broke beyond explanation. A loser of note had nothing through a cycle of pain. But when I connected to God and the ministry, I can't explain how it happened, but it did. Till today, they point fingers at my business. They've sent judgments through court, but no weapon formed against me will prosper. I'm boasting and Paul says, in the Lord, connect to God with everything you have. I'm telling you something from testimony. Connect to God. Connect to 10 rand, 20 rand. Connect with coming to sweep and clean here. Feds came over here yesterday to clean this church. Some of us is, 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 is not busy on a Saturday. And maybe we never ask, and I, and I, I must apologize for that. But tie up with somebody. Guys, I saw this outside. Can I come and fix it? I'm good with this. I saw you're looking for somebody to paint this back wall over here. Can I come and do it? I know you'll need somebody to clean. I can't have ladies cleaning gents' toilets. I'm available. I can come and do it. And God sees. Because he said to Cornelius, I've seen all. This is New Testament. I've seen how you've helped in the church. The angel of the Lord came. Cornelius was in distress. And the angel settled by Cornelius. Take note, Cornelius was a Gentile. He was not a Jew. 
And the angel of the Lord said, I've seen what you've done. I've seen your giving. I've seen you've always given. And he was talking about money. The angel of the Lord, talking about money, yeah, it's in the word of God. And he says, and God has seen it, and God has received it as worship. I'm telling you, your lives will change. My life has changed and I'm still leaning on that covering protection and love and favor of God. I know that that favor rests on you from the little you have to the most. Share all good things with the one who teaches you. If you believe that this house teaches you, we shouldn't be in arrears with that rent. We shouldn't. Somebody, God will bless somewhere and the Holy Spirit will land it on you and say, don't forget the church. Don't forget the church. Don't forget to give that portion to the church. Somebody, we don't need to be in the arrears. I say that openly. We don't need to actually battle because the churches were never poor. The churches soared to the poor. So as you give, more than just the giving, I thank God that hearts have been opened this day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Father, for your word on giving. Thank you for your word, oh God. Thank you that your word goes in and changes us. Bless every heart here today, God. Minister to each and every one of us in ways of how we can do and do more for our local fellowship, to the extension of the kingdom of God, for the winning of souls, for the changing of lives and families, oh God. Help us, oh God. Take us away from this religious thought, oh God, that money is evil. And Father, show us, oh God, that we have control over everything. Bless your people to stay as they give and bless those that don't have therefore they do have giving hearts and make it possible for them too to partake in this. In Jesus' precious holy name, amen. You can take up the offering. While we take up the offering, I just want to give two announcements. The one is that we are going to be leaving this place very soon. We are. I've already notified the landlord that we're going from here. It's definite that we are looking at something closer to Wentworth. Not something dead center in Wentworth because we don't want to lose the other people because it's not easy. We tried, guys. We tried looking for places closer. Right now, we're looking at anywhere Tara Road. If it's in Wentworth in a nice like when I say I'm talking about a safe place, only because of the equipment and experience. We've got to use wisdom as well. There were some towns where the Holy Spirit said to Paul, don't go in there. Don't. Minister, but get out. Don't, don't go in there. So we've got to consider all things. I'm from Wentworth, guys. I'm from the epicenter, the core center of Wentworth, Pascal. K1. If you go and do a Google map search and you look up, you will see that where my mother's house is, is the dead center of Wentworth. Between the four main roads. I'm scared of Wentworth. I grew up there. Grew up among the worst, worst, worst gangsters. Tried one to be one myself. Failed hopelessly. But I'm known in Wentworth. I know for a fact that we will more than quadruple in size in a month if we go to Wentworth. So I should have went a long time if that's what I was seeking or we were seeking. But we're seeking to what, for what God wants us to do. Not numbers. I mean it. Not numbers. It's about souls. It's about your family. Before anyone knew, my prayer is that your family, my family, fills a road. Some of us are here just by ourselves. Just, just one or two. Like me. You didn't do anything wrong. The time is coming when everybody else will suffer and the light will shine on you. Darkness is, a, is falling, guys. You can't stop that. But the light will fall on you. And very soon, you wouldn't even need to use words. They'll say, how come it's not with you? That's because I can only point you to one place, the cross. Come to Dialogue Church. Come in here. I don't want to make it sound. We're not, and don't be shy to say we're not like other churches. Don't. Differentiate yourself. 
be not like other churches. Come in here. You want to know why? Come in here. You want to know why everyone can be sick in a family except you? Come in here. Sometimes God will protect you. I'm not saying if you got sick that, that, that oh, there's something wrong with you. No. No. But you know how God protects you. You got that personal thank you story for God that he done for you that you saw happen on your family that never happened on you. Things you came through that others are battling to come through. The water that drowned others that you are walking on. The storm that is killing them is one that you are riding. You got your own thank you story and it's that thank you story. I pray God will bring about a glow and a brightness, a seraphim brightness to fall upon you in a time of darkness that the others may see and come because of God's light that is on you. Let's pray. A blessing. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you his peace. May the light of God and the favor of God shine upon you. Though darkness may come, may his goodness and mercy surround you and, and cover you in everything that you do. Whatever you do, may it be blessed. Let it multiply. May God show favor over you on your jobs. May he mention your names even in meetings that oppose you. May, may he be your reach where your hand is limited. May he be your debt where you have no finances to pay. May God cover and protect you this week like never before. May he open a door that no man can shut. May he exchange your weakness for his strength. May he exchange your little faith for his faith in Jesus' precious holy name. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen, Amen, Amen. God bless you. Life in the kingdom. You don't want to miss that. You don't want to miss it. God bless you as you go.